If India and China are wealthy, that's great. Adam Smith said, you don't want poor neighbors, you want wealthy neighbors. Hi, I'm Ted Balaker with Reason TV, and today I'll be speaking with Professor Joyce Appleby. Appleby is a historian at UCLA. Her most recent book is The Relentless Revolution, A History of Capitalism. Let's talk about the title. It's the, the Relentless Revolution. Why did you title it that way? Because capitalism produces a relentless revolution, as we can tell by reading The Economist every week or picking up The New York Times or Reason Magazine, I'm sure. It, it, it's constant change. Because as I insist in my book that capitalism is really a cultural system based on an entrepreneurial economy, it impinges on everything in a society. It's got a voracious appetite for money, but energy and talent and, and innovation, and this is very uh, disruptive of settled ways. And that's one of the recurring themes in the book, is this idea that there is an upheaval that harms people and then progress later on. Can you address that? We had the agrarian revolution, the industrial right. evolution, as you call it, and today well, with, with... I didn't say, I said it wouldn't catch on. <laughs> <laughs> well, just... We're trying, we're trying. <laughs> Both the agricultural changes and the industrial ones are more evolved than, re than produced a revolution. They are absolutely essential developments for capitalism to emerge. Because as I said, you have capitalist practices, but you don't have capitalism until the economy dominates political thinking, provides people with a new vocabulary for talking about change inspires new social values so that people don't want to do the same thing that their grandparents did, but accept innovation and change. And you say that commerce alone is not capitalism. No, it, commerce is as old as, as Hammurabi. You know, it's been around for millennia. And, it, and merchants stayed within their place in society, basically aristocratic societies. But capitalism couldn't keep its space because it involved people. It took laborers to produce for capitalism. So it could not content itself with a little interstitial space in society. It had to come to dominate because it had to change laws. It had to free up uh, market exchanges and the like, and this took political power. So capitalism has this propulsive force that commerce alone does not. You talk about capitalism uh, being rooted in culture, not just uh, an economic process, as a lot of people think of it. And changing minds, changing habits. I think one of the interesting points was the idea that in pre-capitalist society, famines weren't necessarily something to be fixed, right? It was just right. sort of the way, could you explain? Like that Because that seems so strange to us today. Right. Could you explain that mindset? Well, yes, I think that in the traditional society, they had one of the reasons they had traditions that endured is because everything remained the same. The only variations you had uh, actually were agricultural harvest. Good years brought prosperity, maybe a little more spending, a little fuller stomachs. Bad years, belt tightening, often famines. But everything repeated itself. And because it repeated itself, it just seemed like this was the way it was supposed to be. And what about now in the 21st century? Everybody is, uh, you know, sometimes there's a lot of talk today about uh, uh, whether uh, America is, is in decline. Uh, there's a lot of press about China having the second biggest economy now, although ours is still vastly bigger. Uh, you, you touch on some of the reforms in the, in the 1990s that India implemented right. to get rid of the license Raj, uh, all these uh, kind of Byzantine restrictions, the mm -hmm. red tape. Since the history of capitalism seems to be, uh, you know, there's a new country right around the corner, what do you think the future will bring now? You know I'm an historian. I'm not a, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I'm, a, I'm a lot better at explaining the past than I am at predicting the future. Well, I, I'm asking I, you to be a futurist now. <laughs> right. I have great confidence in America. I think it has real problems real challenges. I think we're going through an awfully bad patch now. I think our politics now are kind of preventing us having an industrial policy and doing many of the things that we ought to be doing, but I cannot believe we won't do it. Uh, it and I think if India and China are wealthy, that's great. Adam Smith said, you don't want poor neighbors, you want wealthy neighbors. The more wealth there is in the world, the better off it is for everyone, not only in the sense of personal lives, but just in the growth of the economy of innovation, uh, 
perhaps getting to a point where we have a great deal more leisure in the world. That's such an important point, I think, because I think a lot of people have the mindset of like, this is some global, you know, football game or war or something that if we ascend, that means someone else right. drops. Right. The zero-sum pie has never applied to a capitalist economy. It's never been a zero-sum pie. It's always expanding. And uh, what about public opinion in, in how people view capitalism these days? If you look at recent polls, even in the United States, if you ask people, what do you think about capitalism, it gets mixed reviews. What do you make of that? I don't think that the criticism goes very deep because there isn't a conspicuous alternative. And that's a good point. How, how would capitalism stack up against competing systems? Well, I think it's stacked up pretty well against competing systems. I mean, I know people who are unhappy about the economy are kind of horrified when you say that. I think that we're, as I say, I think we're in a very bad patch. I think it's terrible that you have the, the income inequality and the drop in income that we've seen and a decline in social mobility that we've seen in the United States in the last 20, 30 years. Those are serious problems and I'm not minimizing them, but I, it, all it takes is political will to solve those problems. Uh, you have an interesting line, I think. Exploitation is not exclusively capitalist, but wealth creation is. Can you right. explain that? Well, people say uh, capitalism exploitative, and of course that's what Marx dwelt on because there were horrible conditions in factories in the 19th century, and in, in the world today there are. Uh, but the exploitation in traditional societies was just dreadful. So the, you know, the, the peasantry was treated with contempt, Peasant daughters were seen as just the natural sexual partners of, of the aristocracy. I mean, people who think that capitalism is, is the major exploitative system simply don't know very much about the Middle Ages or the 14th or 15th, 16th centuries. Um, and the reason I contrast this with wealth generating is because this is what capitalism has done. We're in this building because of capitalism. They didn't have buildings like this. They didn't have information technology. They didn't have the University of California. Uh, so you can't, you can separate the good from the bad, but they are kind of linked together. If you want this level of enjoyment of science, the arts, entertainment, food, transportation, information, etc., then you have to be recognize what's generating the wealth to produce it. A fella kicking, screaming, three quarters through the 20th century, and two hands that cured me so well. Curiosity helped with learning, and teachers tried to educate me all as well. I'm lucky, don't you know?